morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka. If you please join me in standing together, we're going to begin by singing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Pen, but we just ask that you would fill out the card 
and return it to us sometime today, either maybe later in the offering time or after the service at the Guest Hospitality Center over here. If you could return it to us, we'd love to give you a gift and say welcome and thank you for worshiping the Lord together with us this morning. We have a few announcements as we begin. I would like to give one more announcement about the worship choir. We'll be starting in two weeks. Uh, next week we'll be in the park, but the week after that will be our first rehearsal for worship choir for the fall season. Looking forward to that. Uh, maybe you'd like to be a part of that and you haven't let me know yet. Uh, please fill out a choir commitment card if you're planning on being a part of that. Or if you have some questions about it first, feel free to talk to me. We'd love to have some new faces and some new voices in choir if you're interested in that. We begin rehearsing at 8.45 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We rehearse each Sunday all the way through the end of the year or until the Christmas season at least. So if you'd like to be a part of that, feel free to fill out a choir commitment form and then you can put it either under the office door or you can give it to me or put it under my door uh, just to let me know that you're planning on being a part of that. We have a few more announcements. As Pastor Nate said, next week we will be in the park and uh, so I want to give you information about that. If you're not sure where that's located, if you just go out to the front of the church to the light and turn right, um, that's Patel Park just down there. It's in uh, the van stand down at the end. Uh, bring a lawn chair. We will provide chairs, but uh, I'm sure your lawn chairs are more comfortable, so bring a long lawn chair for that. Um, bring sunglasses. Dress casually or outside. Now, someone asked, what if it rains? Uh, if the weather does not cooperate, then we'll just be back here. Uh, so if you show up down there and there's no one there, then we are probably here. Um, I do want to encourage you. Uh, we will have a shuttle bus that is running people back and forth. If you would like to park here at church, uh, you can do that. Um, and uh, so up until just a few minutes before, we'll have the bus coming back and forth. And so come here. Uh, there is not a lot of parking down there. So if you show up late or if you show up uh, and there's no parking, this is the place to come. Uh, also, we need, if you are willing to help with uh, setup and tear down, we still need a number of people. And you please sign up. If you're planning on staying for the meal, please sign up so you know how much food to prepare for that. The week after that is our Invite Your One Sunday. And I hope you've been praying about and inviting people to come to that. If you haven't, I encourage you to do that. You still have a couple more weeks. And so uh, there are more cards available so you can invite people. Tonight is a uh, busy evening. Uh, there is an Awana meeting at 5 o'clock. If you're planning on working in Awana, maybe you have or you haven't, but you would like to, um, be at that meeting at 5 o'clock, uh, and uh, you can find more about that. And then at 6 o'clock, this is not in the bulletin, but at 6 o'clock we will be having a missionary family here, uh, Micah Tuttle. Uh, that is uh, Andrew Hines' brother-in-law. Him and his uh, Micah's family will be here. They were here about uh, four years ago. Uh, they're ministering in the country of Georgia, and they're going to be here tonight to give us an update and tell us more about their ministry. So I encourage you to be here for that. I know you'll enjoy that. Also, growth groups this week uh, as well. Uh, but I uh, want to make one note in the bulletin. It said that those of you who normally meet at the Watson's house uh, this week, it'll be at the Swinehearts. And so just make that note of that. We're going to ask our men to come forward for our morning uh, worship offering. And as they're coming, let's pray. God, we do thank you that we can be here to worship you. Uh, you are just such a powerful, uh, yet at the same time loving God. And so Lord, as we come this morning, we are thankful for all the many provisions, not just life, not just how you provide for us day to day, but Lord, most importantly for our salvation. So Lord, we uh, desire to worship you. And we have this opportunity through our giving, and I pray you'll help us to do it out of love for you, uh, and not just out of obligation. Lord, we thank you again, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
time worshiping in song. Scriptures say, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And that is the prayer that we're going to be learning this morning in Psalm, a Christian's daily prayer, is that each and every morning Christ would display his glory through us. So let's sing together a Christian's daily prayer.
Father, we come together this morning resting in the merits of what Jesus has done for us. And it's our prayer that you would, through this church, bring yourself glory. First this morning, through the time that we spend around your word, as our pastor preaches, that you would give us attention to the word, not just to hear it, but to heed it as well, to obey as we leave this place, to be changed, to be more like Christ. And then as we go out each day this week, that we would represent you and glorify you in our workplaces, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. Father, you give us security. We sang together, be still my soul. We can find encouragement and trust in the fact that there's nothing we can do that puts you on the side of the enemy. Once you have saved us, you hold us securely. And so, Father, this morning we rejoice to know that though we may have had a week in which we sin many times, a week in which we fell, we rejoice to know that you pick us up, you give us grace to move forward, you use broken people. And so I pray this morning that we would not be surrounded by guilt based on what we have done, that we would rest securely in what Christ has done. And that you would give us encouragement then to move forward in the grace of Jesus Christ who holds us fast. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able to, would you please join me in standing once more as we sing our final song together. He will hold me fast.
seated. At this time, children who are in junior church may be dismissed. This morning we'll be having our scripture reading from Psalm chapter 4. It's nice to be able to be heard this week. Psalm chapter 4. We're going to read through all eight verses. If you would follow along. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O oh men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Selah. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your hearts on your beds and be silent. Selah. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that we can study your word this morning, and I pray it help us to understand this psalm uh, and see that its impact on us and its meaning for us even today. We ask that you are glorified through this time. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. If you haven't turned there already, turn to Psalm 4. Psalm 4. We uh, concluded last week a series that we have been on for nine months on the gospel and uh, I was been praying about for the last few months about what I was going to do when that finished, and and uh, I've watched throughout this year uh, many of you go through trials and struggles, and um, I I decided that and God led me to going through a series where, where there's a few series we're going to do through the remainder of this year, and in between those we're going to we're going to look at Psalms and we're going to look at various Psalms as we go through and I, I wanted to look at Psalms for today because I thought this was a uh, an excellent psalm to look at have you ever felt alone have you ever felt like nobody cared I mean you're in a world where there's people all around and, and you have family and you have friends and yet you feel alone feel like you're suffering and no one knows what's going on. Here in this passage, in this psalm, King David was having similar thoughts. And he cried out, we're going to go through this whole psalm, but he cried out in verse 1, God, give me some relief from this pain. Now, a background on Psalm 4. We don't know exactly when Psalm 4 was written. There's, there's some various views on this. Some believe that if you, if you look later in the, in the passage in verse 7, it talks about uh, not having grain and wine. And, and so some believe this was a, a drought that hit Israel and Israel alone, and so they were suffering with that. But most commentaries and most theologians believe that Psalm 4 is a companion passage to Psalm 3. Well, if you look back at Psalm 3, what was taking place, it, the title tells you, it says, when he fled from Absalom, his son. And so most people believe that this was written at a time when David was, man, he was having a hard time. His son Absalom had, had, had stirred up a rebellion against him. And he was alone. I think we can all uh, empathize and sympathize with David. Every single Christian, without exception, has known hard times. You know, somehow we think, and, and, and maybe we were taught wrongly, that as Christians, we're, we're not going to go through trials. We're not going to go through difficult times. We're not going to go through times of, of loneliness. That's not the case. I mean, even study the, the men and women of the Bible, and you see... Uh, almost every single one of them went through hard times. I mean, even David, David was 
king. David was the greatest king that ever lived in the nation of Israel, and yet David had some deep, deep, deep valleys. So we can sympathize. But what was bothering David at this moment? Well, as I said, we're not exactly sure, but let's look and see what he says. What was it that was that was that was bothering him so much. It wasn't that he had a wrong view of God, because I want you to notice the way that he addresses God. In verse 1, he says, Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. That's an interesting phrase. It's a unique form of address. In fact, this is the only place in the entire Bible where God is spoken to this way. And basically what he is saying this is he is understanding that God is the author and the giver of righteousness. He's saying, oh God, of my righteousness. In other words, he's saying, God, you are the maintainer of my righteousness. You are the rewarder of my righteousness. My righteousness is in God. So I don't believe that David had lost a glimpse of who God was. I think David fully understood God here. I think David fully, I mean, he, this is not at a point in his life where he is spiritually away from God. I mean, he is, he is in the presence of God, and yet he's hurting. He's lonely. And we should be able to relate to that phrase, my righteousness is God. Our righteousness is because of Jesus Christ. And, and we talked about the gospel, and the gospel tells us that our righteousness was revealed through Jesus Christ, and our righteousness is the result of the death of Jesus Christ. So we can understand what David is saying, but we can also understand his pain. So I want to look at three aspects this morning about David's pain. First of all, I want to look at his reason for pain. This passage, again, we don't know exactly why, when it was written, but we, we do see from the passage, we can glean there's two things that were bothering David specifically. First of all, we see that the unbelieving people were trying to shame the glory of David's faith. Say, so what do you mean by that? Look at verse 2. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? You think of contrasts in the Bible, and there's numerous ones. You think of light and darkness. You think of victory and defeat. But here we see one, uh, another one, and that is glory and shame. The men were turning, whoever these men were, were turning David's glory into its reverse, into its opposite, which is shame. Let me explain to you what is being talked about here. In, in the ESV it says, how long will my honor, that, that word honor um, it means glory or that which I glory in, how long will that be turned into shame? Reminder of who David was for a moment. David, as we study scripture, if we say it this way, David was the runt of the litter in his, in his family's house. He was the youngest of boys. He was one that was, was, um, was told to go out into the, the hills and the, in the fields and take care of the sheep. His father did not even consider him worthy. When, when Samuel came, when Samuel the prophet came to, to appoint the next king, his father didn't even feel him worthy enough to bring him to that assembly. But out of the blue, God intervened in David's life. God raised him up. God gave him a victory over Goliath. God made him one that was, was praised. He was elevated and protected and prospered because of God's amazing grace. And David understood that. And David is talking about the glory. But the, what David is talking about here with the glory or this honor is not his own. He's not saying, hey, you, you have soiled my reputation. He's saying this, my glory. In other words, uh, it's the glory that he had. But what was he referring to? He's referring to God. He was referring to all that God had given him by the mercies of God. If you were to ask David, did he glory in his vast kingdom, he would have said, not a chance. If you were to ask David if he gloried in his military power, he was the most powerful Israeli uh, king ever, he would have said, not, not at all. If you were to ask him if he gloried in, in his, uh, his treasuries that were full of gold and, and silver, he would have said, no. If you would have said to David, what is it you glory in? He would have said, my glory is in the Lord. All that I have is a free gift from God. There is, there, I am nothing without God. He is my glory. And that is what he's talking about here when he says, Oh men, whoever these men were, how long are you going to, are, are you going to turn the glory of God into shame? These men had taken a knife and they had, 
They had stabbed the glory of God and they had turned it into something that was not glorious. These men were opposed to God's commands. They, were, they, they belittled the words of God. They, they put down the prophets of God. They, they ignored the Sabbath of God. They forgot the covenants of God. And, and they had turned all of that into something that they mocked. And they mocked David and they mocked his Lord. And just like we saw when David faced Goliath, David did not appreciate that. So here David is in his time of loneliness and he's calling out and he's saying, God, hear me. How long are these men going to do this? You ever feel like everyone's against you? The Bible tells us that all who live in the Lord will have their glory turned into shame. We look in the Bible and we see that over and over again. Pharaoh uh, put down the glory of Jehovah even after Jehovah, even after God humbled all of the gods that Egypt worshipped. Jezebel and Ahab, they sent prophets of Baal throughout the land of Israel pouring contempt on all that Jehovah had done. Nebuchadnezzar threw three young men who would, were willing to stand for the glory of God, threw them into a fiery furnace because they refused to bow. And even today, we live in a world that is anti-Christian. There's a flood of anti-Christian books and, and propaganda that fills our culture, mocking the God of the Bible and turning it into shame. David looked at these mockers and he said, how long will this go on? How long are you going to sit in your hatred? You, you are confident in who you are now, but, but what about the future? When you lie in your deathbeds and eternity seems so long and death is so final, will you still disdain and hate the glory of God? He goes on and he says at the end of verse 2, he says, How long will you love vain words? I actually like the way that the NIV translates it. It says, How long will you love delusions? You understand when someone is deluded. It makes me think of the book, uh, uh, one of the all-time best-seller anti-Christian books is a book called The God Delusion. <coughs> It's by Richard Dawkins, and it made him millions of dollars. And basically the whole thing, the premise of the whole thing is that, that, that Christianity has been deluded to believe that there is a God. But really what that book is, is, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a glorified book about how, how atheists, God-haters, have been deluded. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and that is true. The Bible tells us that Jesus came and he died, and on the third day he rose again for us, and that is true. And the Bible says one day he will come in clouds of glory, and that is true. And all those that say they hate God, and they don't believe in God, and they mock God, will stand in the presence of God. I was reading about a, a school teacher, her name was Julie Savage. She wrote um, in a, an article in a magazine about uh, and described her own angry atheism. She said, I hated the idea of God. She said it this way. She said, Christianity was simply an oppressive system of thought. And the sooner the world was free from this thought, the better. She went on and said this. I lived out my atheist beliefs every way I could. I even made a will that specified that I was to have a humanist funeral, and my funeral was to do this, was to tell the world that God was dead. I used my teaching position, both subtly and overtly, to undermine Christianity. I sent hostile emails to various Christian anti-abortion groups. I enjoyed the challenge, often boasting to my students of my many victories. One of the things that she describes was she would go on to forums, online forums, and she would debate, Christian forums, and she would debate with Christians. By the way, that goes on all the time. She would debate with Christians on how, how, how God didn't exist. 
There was one such person that she argued with, and this individual began to pray for her. And he began to pray that she would be driven and understand the glorious reality of who God was. And one day he said this line from David. He said to her, he said, How long, Julie, will you turn God's glory into shame? Months went by and a change began to happen in Julie's life. An increasing, uh, what she described as an intellectual curiosity replaced her fierce antagonism. She began to ask the question, are you really there, God? One day she finally decided, she said, I'm going to go for the first time ever visit a church. She described how she drove to this church that she was going to visit and she couldn't bring herself to go into the building and so she sat in the car the whole service. The next week she did the same thing and for three or four weeks she did that where she drove there and just sat in the car. Finally on the fifth week she got out of her car and she walked into the service and she sat through an entire service. She did it again the next week and the next week and the next week. She said she attended for months. All the time, all she said to herself was she was looking for ammunition, how she could give a final blow to this God that Christians worship. But she began to be pricked. She said to herself, I'll just ignore him and he'll go away. One day she described she was, uh, went to bed early because she was tired and at one o'clock she found herself wide awake. She says, I remember going downstairs and just sitting there, and a sense of nothingness grew inside of me. And suddenly I became aware of the presence of God. I didn't see Him. I didn't hear Him. But I knew His reality. And I knew He was saying to me, Julie, that's enough. And He was right. During the moments that followed, I decided to adopt, no, I decided not to adopt some religious principle or embrace some therapeutic system. I didn't even become that religious, as some would say. Rather, I entered into a relationship with God, the one who had hung on the cross for me so that I could know him. Later, she said, on, on reflection, I believe that that awful nothingness I experienced that night was a glimpse of what it means to be separated from God for all eternity. And her life was changed by the power of God. She said, years later, I've discovered in the past years that he is no delusion, but he is real. And see here, David is grieving. He's grieving in verse 2 because he says, how long will God's glory be turned into shame and how long are you going to believe these delusions? He concludes that section by saying, in seeking after lies that that lies refers to false gods, and David was speaking to those who were, who were, who were not only were they rejecting God, but they were then, then accepting these false gods that were giving them nothing. When Jehovah God was willing to give them so much. So David was, his reason for his pain was they were turning the glory of God into shame. Secondly, this is where it hit home for David, was God was not immediately answering. Look at verse 1, he says, answer me when I call God. This is, not a, this is not a comment of David yelling at God. This is a comment of David pleading with God. God, answer me. Look at he goes on in that. He says, you have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer, please. But why wasn't God answering him? Why does God not sometimes answer us? Have you ever felt that way? I know I have. I know I've had moments of begging and pleading, moments of getting on my knees in tears, saying, God, where are you? And I know full well where he is. But in my heart, I ache. And that's what David's doing here. Because sometimes, sometimes we, we have this opinion that God is like some waiter in an in a, in a excellent restaurants and he comes to serve us and he says what can I get for you are you ready to order 
Is, is everything to your liking? Is there anything else I can get you? But God is not a celestial waiter. We wait on God. He doesn't wait on us. And he answers us when and how he deems best. Why? For our own good. And sometimes, and David understood this, is sometimes God waits because he knows we're not ready for the answer yet. So he tells us to wait. Many of you probably have read the book Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. It's, the, uh, it's an allegory of, of coming to Christ and the journey in our Christian life. And the main character in the story is a man by the name of Christian. And somewhere in his journey, he meets a man by the name of Hopeful. And he's talking to Hopeful and, and he's asking Hopeful when he came to assurance of his salvation in Jesus Christ. And Hopeful explains to him, he says this to him, he says, I have prayed over and over and over again for God to reveal himself to me, but he doesn't. He even made this statement, he said, I prayed a hundred twice. In other words, I prayed, I prayed so many times that I'm, I, I, I'm weary of praying. And Christian said, why did you give up that? And he makes a statement, he said this, I believed that that was true which was told me. That without the righteousness of this Christ, all the world could not save me. Therefore I thought, if I leave off, if I stop to pray, then I die. And then I, this came to my mind. Though I tarry, wait for it, because surely God will reveal himself. So I continue to pray until the Father shows me his Son. You know, Hopeful did not cease praying, though he did not immediately get an answer. So I think we are so ingrained with the idea that, you know, in, especially in our culture, that whatever I want, I get immediately. And, and David understood the idea here. He's saying, how long am I going to pray? And you not hear me. So David understood that. See, here, here, is, here is the thing, is you may never get the relief from your pain if you stop praying. Don't give up. Some of you have been praying for that one prayer request, whether it's the salvation of a, a loved one, whether it's healing from, from a sickness either of your own or a family member, and you're, 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 you're just distraught over it. You've been praying over financial problems. You've been praying over uh, relational problems, whether it's in your marriage or, or in, in your relationship with your kids or your parents or, or some extended family. You continue to pray and pray and pray. And, and, and the reality is, is that you need to keep praying. Someone said this once. They said, pray briefly, but pray often. Pray at the appropriate time and pray at the inappropriate time. In other words, that our, our lives should be so consumed with praying to God that we don't stop. We don't faint because the Bible tells us that God will answer. God does hear. It is not that David sat here and said, uh, you know, God, you're not out there. God, David knew God was there. He's saying, God, hear me. Listen to me. Answer me. So David had, had, had this, this pain that he was going through. But secondly, I want you to notice David's confidence during the pain. See, here is the wonder of Christian life. There are times when we are overwhelmed with weakness, we are overwhelmed with pain, and our prayers are not being answered when we cry. And yet, in such a period in our lives, we can still have confidence in the Savior. We can still have confidence in God. And we see that remarkably in this passage, that David, despite the fact that he, man, he felt beaten, and yet we see a confidence. Let's look at that. There's three things that I noticed that he was confident. First of all, David was confident in the status of God's people. Look at verse 3. But, and so often that is such a, a great uh, conjunction that we see in the Bible. All these things he's saying, hey, I, God, I don't feel like God is answering me. I, I'm, not, I'm waiting for God to hear from me. I'm tired of men who are turning God's glory into shame. Uh, I'm tired of people who are following uh, these false gods and are, are going after these delusions. But I know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. 
David knows that God has dealt with him and has made him different. If you're here today and you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, here's the thing. God has made you different. He's set you apart. You are not like some of your co-workers. You're not like some of your neighbors. You're not like some of your family. God has made you different. David is speaking to those companions who have been influenced by those who are following the delusions and the lies and the false gods. And, and David is saying, hey, God, I, I know, I know God has set me apart. God has set his people apart. Now, David could speak from his own experience in, in a way that we couldn't even. God set him apart for himself. He, he wasn't the firstborn son. He wasn't the warrior like his brothers. And yet, and yet God set him apart. One by one, God rejected all of his brothers, but he chose David, a little shepherd boy, to do the work of God. And so it is with us. Even though we're not kings, we're set apart. Now, we're set apart in a different way because the Bible tells us that when Jesus Christ came to earth, he died for you and I, so that we could have Christ's righteousness. Not our own, so that we can be set apart, so that we can be different. It's not because of anything you have done. It's not because you are outstanding. It's not because you are gifted. No, it's because God has set us apart. He did that because he loved us. Why? Why would God choose us? Why would God set us apart? Why would God love such inconsistent sinners? Because that was his will. And today, your status... Just like David's, but in a different way. Your status is that you are set apart. And so that status should be, it should be something that inspires you with hope, even in times of distress. You know, the reality is no matter what distresses I go through, no matter what pain and agony, no matter what pain and agony you go through, if you are a child of God, then guess what? All of that is a part of God's plan for you. And you are, you are his precious treasure. And he loves you. And David said here, I know that God has set the godly apart for himself. And then secondly, and this is beautiful, David was confident in the privilege of God's people. Look at the end of verse 3. He says, and I know that the Lord hears when I call him. You know, there is something that I think sometimes as Christians, because we feel at times alone, we feel like God does not hear us, that sometimes we take for granted something that is amazing, and that is this, that you can run into the presence of God at any time, night or day, in any place, and all you have to do is whisper into the creator of the world, and he hears you. Love with Paul says, and talking about God, he says we can call him Abba, Father. And we can, we can come to God, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, think about this for a moment. The Bible talks about the greatness of the creation of God, and it talks about the vastness of the universe, and, and scientists have, have discovered all these different um, galaxies and all this, and yet I, I believe that it doesn't even come close to what God has created, and yet even though God has made all these things and knows every single star by name, and yet you sit in, in, the, in the privacy of your bedroom and you say, God, and he hears you. And it's not just that he hears you, but he has an interest in it. David said this, I am confident because I know that he hears me. We can ask anything we want. We can ask the slightest thing, like I, I, I need a place to park, or the, the biggest thing, like my wife is, has health issues, or, 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 or I lost my job, or, or whatever the case may be. And he hears you. You can ask for mercy. You can worship him for redemption, because of redemption. You can call on him, and it's never in vain. He hears you. He hears us. You might be six years old and he hears you. You might be 95 years old and he hears you. And everything in between, God hears us. In our communication with God, there is two distinctly and completely different beings. There is me, a speck of dust, of nothingness. 
And there is God, the immeasurable creator of everything. And yet this God cares about you. And that should be such an incredible boost in your confidence. You may be alone. You may feel like no one understands. You may feel like the stress and the burden of life is just crushing you. And God is saying, and all you have to do is say, Abba. Which simply means, Daddy. And I hear you. David was confident in the status of God's people. He was confident in the privilege of God's people. And thirdly, David was confident enough to exhort God's people. So often when we are in pain, we think, there's no way in my state right now that I can impact other lives and point other people to Christ. But even in David's distress, he turns and he begins to exhort those that were hearing him. He begins to exhort them on how to live their lives. And he, he exhorts them on a number of different things. And I want to look at three of them. He says this. First of all, he says, make sure you don't sin. Look down in verse 4. He begins to exhort them. And he says, be angry and do not sin. He's, he's exhorting them. He's saying, maybe, maybe the fact that God isn't answering you is causing you to be angry. Maybe the fact that, or, or greater than that, maybe the fact that people are dishonoring God is causing you anger or, or that they're following these delusions. He's saying, but be angry, but don't sin. Remember what John said in 1 John chapter 2? He says, my dear children, I write this so that you will not sin. And David here is urging his companions to not let the presence of false religions, not to let the presence of delusions to be an excuse for sinning, not let trials and troubles and tribulations to be your excuse for doing wrong. He's saying, don't do that. Don't allow those, those things to cause you to sin. He was worried about the anger that he sees welling up in his companions. Probably because he understood because it was something welling up in himself. And he's saying, don't Sin. You remember what Paul said in Ephesians when he says, Be angry and sin not to let the sun go down upon your wrath. And uh, that's in a whole section of relationship uh, conversations. And he's saying, Don't go to bed angry. Don't, whether it's with your, your wife or your husband, or, 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 but reconcile. Make it right. The Bible shows us that there is a place for holy anger. Jesus showed us that when he came in and he cleansed the temple, but I, I'm not sure if any of us in, in, in our sinful state can, can do that. God tells us that we're not to be angry and sin. And here, David is reminding them, he says, don't, don't do that. I understand how you're feeling, but don't sin. The second thing he tells them is this, be sure you are searching your hearts. I, I, I love this phrase. He says, ponder in your, in the end of verse 4, ponder in your own hearts on your bed and be silent. There's a couple things from that. You ever lay in bed and you contemplate life? Ever lay in bed? I, I, you know, some of you are different. In my own house, uh, my wife and I are completely different. Okay, uh, my head hits the pillow, and um, before I have a real thought, I'm asleep. <laughs> my wife can sit there, and it takes her a while to get to sleep. Um, and so maybe you're more like that. Okay, I, I've had that times where I lay down and I think oh, I'm just going to take some time to pray, and I think I get out. You know, dear God, and I'm, I'm asleep, so it doesn't work for me. But at, wherever it is, however it is, when you take time to think. Have you pondered your own life? Have you thought in a, in a real way about what God is doing for you? I challenge you to do that. Maybe it's not laying in bed as David was doing, but maybe it's some other time. Turn off the TV. Turn off the computer. Put away the phone. And he says here in this passage, just simply be quiet. And think about what God has done. And think about who God is. And search your own hearts. And ponder your own life. Be silent and think about, consider the glorious creation and the glorious creator. Consider all he has done. You know, so often we, we get so wrapped up in our trials that we 
forget the goodness of God. Thirdly, he tells them, make sure you have a sacrifice you can trust. This is interesting. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There is no way that you can call God your father unless the sacrifice, unless a sacrifice covers your sin. Because the Bible tells us that God can't look on sin. God can't be in the presence of sin. So there is no way that you can communicate to God unless your sin is taken care of. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness of sin. And so that bloodshed demanded by God must be done. You know, God is a holy God. God, God hates sin. Why don't you look over in Psalm chapter 5, the next Psalm over, look at verse 6. This is, this is an amazing thought. You, talking to God, you destroy those who speak lies. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? I mean, it's not a sense of, you know, it's not, yeah, it's not something God likes. It's, you don't do that. No, it says there, you destroy it. Sometimes we hear about God who, who loves the sinner and hates the sin, and I think, I think that's an accurate phrase, but I think in doing that sometimes that we, we really forget how much God hates sin. And over and over in the Bible, God surely does love the worst of sinners. And yet the Bible tells us that the worst of sinners will, will face damnation. And judgment. And the question is, how can God, this holy God who hates sin, how can he ever completely cover evil men in all their evil deeds and yet still remain a just and, and sin-hating God? And the Bible tells us it's by a sacrifice. And not just any kind of sacrifice. See, David understood sacrifice as meaning something where they would go and, and they would offer an animal. But that's, that's not what he's talking about. This, this sacrifice is different. It's a, it's a righteous sacrifice. It's an authorized sacrifice. It's a planned sacrifice. It's an acceptable sacrifice. It's a blameless sacrifice. In the Old Testament, that was displayed in lambs. But the blood of animals can't cleanse. The blood of animals can't cleanse real people of real sin. Animal sacrifices were just a symbol. And, and they, they were a symbol. And those in the Old Testament who believed that they were, they were a symbol pointing forward to the Lamb of God. That, that John talked about when Jesus walked in. And we, I preached on this just a few weeks ago. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world. God is so holy that he must punish sin. And it happened at the cost of his Son. And David comes here and he says the message that I think we all need to hear. He says this, offer right sacrifices. Well, the right sacrifice is not something we need to offer anymore because Jesus did it for us. And then he says, and then put your trust in the Lord. Trust in God. And that was the confidence that David had. That God would get him through this because of all who God was. And then finally, in the next few moments, I want to look at David's peace during the pain. We looked at David's reason for the pain. We looked at David's confidence during the pain. And I want to look at David's peace. We continue on in verse 6. He says, there are many who say, who will show us some good? See, in David's day, there was people who were asking, hey, show us a sign that God is, is, is listening to us. Show us some sort of way that you can prove to us that God is listening. That was something that Jesus heard as well. Remember, uh, they came and they asked Jesus for a sign. He says, I've given you all the signs that you need. And you still don't believe. And here they come and they say, you know, show us something good. I mean, just show us something good. They, they wanted better tricks than, than the prophets of Baal could perform. They wanted something different. They still had problems, and they thought they shouldn't because, because they were doing what God wanted them to do, and, and they still had diseases, and they still had uh, uh, sorrow, and they still had death, and they still had all of these things, and they said, who could show us anything good? 
as if it was such a difficult life to follow God. And they were hoping that, you know, their faith in Jehovah would give them all the things they need. If you look down uh, and, uh, later in this passage, it says, you know, it talks about the grain and the wine. And I mentioned that earlier, but they're asking, you know, why is it that we live such a happy, unhappy life following God? Shouldn't it be that all these things are coming true? And David wants to then answer them. How is he going to answer them when they said, show us something good? Who's going to show us something good? Where's all the good in my life? You ever thought that before? God, I'm following you. Why isn't my life better? Why aren't things easier? So David answers them with three things, and then with this I'll close. First of all, he, David looked around him. Uh, notice this phrase in, at the end of verse 6. He says, Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. What did David say, see when he looked around he saw the light of the Lord's face shining on him. In other words, he looked up and he saw the morning light and he said, oh, God is so good to me. David knew he was a blessed man. Again, I said this a moment ago, but so often in the midst of those hardest times, we miss the blessings around us. Yeah, I understand you are going through that trial. Okay, it may be one that no one else knows. It may be one that we know about. But you are going through that trial. But the reality is, is God has blessed you in so many ways. And if you can't find one single blessing, then at least cling to the fact that Jesus Christ died for you. And that's the greatest blessing of all. It may be that you have the worst life of ever. I don't think that's the case. You still have Jesus. And David says, you know, as I look around, what I saw is, is God was still shining his light upon me. I still had the, the love of God in my life. He knew he was blessed. He knew he had the great face of the Lord smiling down on him hour after hour. And he needed nothing else. But secondly, not only did he look around him, but secondly, he looked within him. Look, look at verse 7, what he says there. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and their wine abound. There is greater joy that comes from, uh, from, from Jesus Christ and from the life with God than having all the food you can ever eat. God can fill your heart with joy even when your refrigerator is empty and there's no money in the bank. And you don't have a job. And at times of poverty, it is possible for Christians to have their heart full of the greatest joy. At times of distress and trial and tribulation, it is still possible to have a joy in your heart that is full. The joy of knowing Jesus Christ had, that had all authority in heaven and earth, that he's working in all things according to the counsel of his will, that he's working all things together for good, that he will never leave us, that he will supply all our needs, that all grace will abound towards us should be something that gives us joy unspeakable, as the Bible talks about. David said, you know what? I could have all those things. And it still wouldn't be the same, as much joy as you put in my heart. There should be that joy there. And finally, he looked around him, he looked within him, and then finally he looked to the Lord. Look at verse 8. In peace I both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O God, make me dwell in safety. <laughs> David was able to lie down at the end of the day in the darkness of his bedroom and he wasn't afraid. You know, David went through hard times in his life. He went through times when he was being hunted by King Saul. He went through times when he was, uh, he was faced with great adversity and yet David said, I, I, he goes, I know I can lay down. Why? Because you are my safety. He knew that when he woke up in the morning, he, uh, God watched over him all night. And God never sleeps, never slumbers. And he was there smiling over him all again. 
Whatever we face currently, whatever you face in the years to come, there is one truth that is more unshakable than anything in this world, and that is that God will make us dwell in safety. No matter what trial comes your way, no matter how big the threats are from outside, from the world around us, from, from all around us, everywhere we go, God will make sure that you dwell in the secret place of the highest. The Bible says in, in that you will dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. As I went through this passage this week, you know, this passage spoke to me in a huge way. God is, God loves us. God loves you. In whatever distresses you have, however ang much angst you feel, you need to understand that God is there. God has not abandoned you. God has not turned his back on you. God loves you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the beauty of of this passage. We thank you for the psalmist and his understanding of all that you had done for him and all that you have done for us. And God, I come to you right now, even personally. You know the angst and the sorrows of my heart. And I ask for you to hear me. But I also come to you as the pastor of these people. Lord, I know Lord, I know there are many out here that are hurting. They're going through pain and trials. Lord, I know there are some out here that their health or the health of a loved one is, is causing them great pain. Lord, I pray that you allow them to feel a joy and to, to understand the light of your presence on their, in their life. Lord, I know that there's some out here who are going through trials with relationships. Lord, there's some here who are going through trials financially. And Lord, there's some here who are going through trials I, I don't even begin to know or understand. Lord, I pray that you will hear us. Lord, we'll, that you will not allow the, the naysayers of the world that are, that are telling us there is no God believing delusions that are hearing these lies and, and following false ways that you will allow, not allow those things to creep in and affect the way that we think and discourage us even more but yet Lord that you will allow us to, to contemplate our own lives to live faithfully before you and I ask that you will be glorified through our lives this week we ask this in Christ's name Please join me in standing together as we sing our final song. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus.
as Liz had her back surgery this past week as she has an extensive recovery, um, let's be in prayer for both of them. Should we pray to you? Thank you, Lord, for this day, and I thank you for our pastor who has preached your word to us. I do pray that you would continue to use these words in our hearts, uh, not simply that we would walk away and bless the message, but that we would um, meditate upon the message and continue to grow as a result of our interaction with your Holy Spirit using your word uh, in our hearts. We do lift up to you this morning, Pastor and Liz Miller. ask that you would give special grace to both of them, uh, to Liz as she has uh, had the surgery and as she will be in recovery for quite some time. Uh, we thank you that the surgery was successful uh, in the eyes of the medical professionals. We just pray that you would now, this time, give strength to her body and give her spiritual strength as she uh, goes through this road on recovery. And we pray for Pastor as well and ask that you continue to give to him grace. Uh, help him as uh, obviously this has made a change uh, between uh, the two of them with their living arrangements and she's in recovery. Would you please give to him uh, special grace at this time as well? As a congregation, help us to remember to uplift them in prayer as we go about our days. Dismiss us now with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.